The Philosophy of Praxis, Marx, Lucas, and the Frankfurt School by Andrew Feinberg. Uh, this is chapter four, Reification and Rationality. Culture and the Crisis of Rationality. Husserl's 1935 Vienna lecture ended with an ominous warning. There are only two escapes from the crisis of European existence. The downfall of Europe in its estrangement from its own rational sense of life its fall into hostility toward the spirit and into barbarity, or the rebirth of Europe from the spirit of philosophy through a heroism of reason that overcomes a naturalism once and for all. Husserl was reacting to the rise of romantic and pessimistic occurrence of thought, a, Sp a Spenglerian mood of doom hanging over Europe. The earlier attempts of Dill Dilthey and the Neo-Kantians to distinguish humanistic knowledge from natural science and to salvage thereby a space for spirit in an increasingly mechanized world had failed. Triumphant science and technology were met by increasing hostility to reason itself. Heidegger's impressive attempt to formulate a philosophical alternative to disintegrating rationalism came to grief and a lamentable involvement with fascism. Lucas II was a product of an intellectual environment that favored the idea of independent Geisteswissenschaften as against bourgeois social science and vulgar Marxism. He responded to the crisis with a return to Marx for a solution in the philosophical domain. His version of heroic rationalism was based on the revolutionary socialist movement. Like the young Marx demanding the realization of philosophy, Lucas insisted that what is at stake in the struggle for socialism is not only a change in society, but also the fate of rationality. The revolution is an affair of reason. But Lucas's path to Marxism was long and began with the very romantic critique of rationalism that led so many other thinkers to reactionary conclusions. The purpose of this chapter is to introduce Lucas's concept of reification through which he attempted to reconcile the themes of that early critique with renewed faith in reason. Reification means literally treating human relations as relations between things. In Lucas's usage, the thing implied in the ray of reification is not just an entity in general, but an object suited to formal rational comprehension, prediction, and technical control. Lucas writes, what is important is to recognize clearly that all human relations, viewed as the objects of social activity, assume increasingly the form of objectivity of the abstract elements of the conceptual systems of natural science and of the abstract substrata of the laws of nature. And also, the subject of this action likewise assumes increasingly the attitude of the pure observer of these artificially abstract processes, the attitude of the experimenter. The problem, Lucas argues, is not with scientific reason per se, but with its application beyond the bounds of its appropriate object, nature. The bourgeois social sciences do not simply comprehend their objects, but reflect and contribute to the reshaping of society to resemble a thing of nature. Marxism grounds a different dialectical paradigm of knowledge in a social movement capable of realizing that paradigm not merely in theory, but in practice as well. The critique of scientism is recruited to the proletarian cause even as the proletariat becomes the bearer of this alternative form of rationality. As we will see, this surprising synthesis alters both the critique and the idea of reason. Understanding it poses challenge, challenges not all interpreters of Lucas successfully meet. In his youth, Lucas belonged to a group of philosophers and social critics whose principal concern was alienation in modern life. Marx's manuscripts of 1844 interpreted alienation in terms of labor, but this text was still unpublished at the time Lucas and his friends developed their cultural perspective. Their critique drew on the sociology of Weber and especially of Simmel, whose analysis of the tragedy of culture had deep had a deep influence on their thinking. Culture, as they understood it, had both a descriptive and a normative dimension. On the one hand, the hermeneutics of culture distinguished understanding of society from natural science and technology. 
This distinction supported a corresponding distinction between culture as the realm of creative expression and civilization as the domain of practical activity. On the other hand, scientism, mechanization, and commercialism were destructive of personal bildung as a value. Both these senses of culture come together in Lucas's early literary criticism, where the objecti objectifications of culture and customs and mores are analyzed as a rigid second nature, opposed to the personal self-development of the individual. World War I threw bourgeois society into a general crisis, embracing not only the ethical and political domains, but the very substance of its cultural life. As Lucas put it in one early article, the culture of the capitalist epoch had collapsed in itself and prior to the occurrence of economic and political breakdown. Therefore, it is a pressing necessity precisely in the interests of culture in the interest of opening the way to the new culture to bring the long death process of capitalist society to its completion. The alienation sapping the spirit of Europe must be overcome along with the capitalist system that is its material base. Soon after identifying the new culture with communism, Lucas rejected his early formulation of the problem. By 1923, when he published History and Class Consciousness, concepts drawn from Marx's capital and from his own Hegelian interpretation of Marx replaced the cultural approach. No doubt, Lucas believed this was necessary to overcome the vaguely spiritual and politically conservative associations of the concept of culture at that time. But lacking a concept of culture, Lucas was forced to formulate his theory of epochal cultural change in a strange mixture of Marxist economic determinism and idealist philosophical speculation. This has led to much confusion about his meaning. To a lesser degree, Marx's own formulations display a similar ambiguity. Neither of these revolutionary philosophers offer an elaborated theory of the revolution they advocate. Their explanations waver between philosophical deduction and causal necessity without achieving a convincing account. However, in the case of Lucas at least, it is possible to extract a coherent account from his various formulations. This is what I will attempt to do in this chapter. In chapter two, I have shown that Marx arrives at the concept of socialism not through an ethical argument, but through a theory of rationality and its demands. Marx's early theory ranks capitalism and socialism as forms of rationality. Their succession is determined less by economic motives or political power than by the logic of his meta-critique. The later Marx sometimes takes this logic for a causal link. This is due to a self-misunderstanding in terms of a scientific paradigm of explanation unsuited to the tasks he set it. Marx claims that capitalism leads to socialism with the inexorability of a law of nature. In fact, he gets from capitalism to socialism not by a causal progression, but by a dialectical demonstration. He argues that just as capitalism has stripped craft producers of their tools, so will it lose control of machinery to the industrial labor force that is called into being. Socialism is thus the negation of the negation. The expropriators are expropriated in the revolution. It is not surprising that unsympathetic critics speak of a religious or ethical ex exigency of socialism in Marx's work, since the economic theory does not live up to Marx's deterministic promise. Lucas takes over Marx's critique of capitalism and projects a socialist resolution to its crises. He is more aware than Marx of the risks of confusing social change with natural processes. He develops a much more elaborate theory of the passage from capitalism to socialism, not as a causal sequence, but, but as a dialectical transcendence of the capitalist paradigm of rational social order by a higher form of socialist rationality. But just because he downplays economic determinism, his argument has been interpreted by later commentators as a pure philosophical deduction. As in the case of Marx, critics claim that Lucas's faith in socialist revolution is founded on a philosophical myth, the myth of the proletariat as identical subject-object of history. The critics misunderstand the concept of social change in Marx and Lucas. But Marx and Lucas are partially responsible since they fail to clearly explain their alternative to philosophical deduction 
and causality. A theory of cultural change could have provided the missing term between Marx's manuscripts and capital, on the one hand, and between the critique of capitalism and the socialist revolution on the other. Unfortunately, when he turned to economic research and abandoned philosophy, Marx left behind the conceptual tools needed to develop such a theory. The theory of alienation in the manuscripts adumbrates a concept of culture that appears more fully developed in Lucas's theory of reification. But as we have seen, Lucas rejected the concept of culture and so appeared to fall back on a philosophical projection of the future. Today we are remote from the sources of Lucas's early concept of culture. The most widely accepted usage of the term no longer has any connection with reactionary culture critique, but derives from sociology and anthropology. Culture now ref refers to the unifying pattern of an entire society, including its typical artifacts, rituals, customs, and beliefs. The concept of culture points toward the common structures of social life. It assigns the researcher the problem of discovering the overarching paradigms of meaning and value that shape all the various spheres of society. The social scientific sense of culture has influenced everyday speech as well. The changed meaning and connotations of culture free the term from, from the associations that trouble Lucas. Today, we can safely identify Lucas's concept of reification as a cultural construct in the contemporary usage of the term. There are, of course, many versions of a cultural approach to understanding society. Those closest in spirit to Lucas's Marxism treat cultural structures as intertwined with the agency of the members of society in a circular pattern. The circularity of culture is a familiar social ontological principle currently referred to by the fashionable term performativity. For example, money is money only insofar as we act as though it were money, and it is the success of this sort of action that determines our conviction that money is in fact money. Social things are not merely things but are implicated in practices. The categories under which social life makes sense are the categories under which it is lived. Gillian Rose shows that this concept of culture has its source in the Neo-Kantian doctrines debated in Lucas's own intellectual environment. The pattern of culture is a kind of naturalized version of the Kantian a priori, a quasi-transcendental precondition of the facts and values it engenders. The status of the precondition becomes ambiguous. It is an a priori that is not empirical, for it is the basis of the possibility of experience but a sociological a priori is ex hypothesi external to the mind and hence appears to acquire the status of a natural object or cause. This neo-Kantian concept of culture operates under the Marxist surface of Lucas's argument, offering a way out of the difficulties of Marx's problematic determinism. According to Lucas, social being and social thought cannot be separately conceptualized and then related by a theory of reciprocal causal interaction, as in most Marxist theory. This view, he argues, leads to an insoluble antinomy of thought and things that can be overcome only by conceiving of thought as a form of reality, as a moment in the total process. The focus must shift from the mechanistic influence of social conditions on consciousness to the generalized patterning of all dimensions of society but what by what rose calls a quasi transcendental form form in this sense is culture as an emergent property of social behavior a property that is irreducible to the traditional categories of subjectivity and objectivity because it constitutes them lucas's theory is based on the double character of the capitalist economy as means of life and form of life, utilitarian instrumentality and foundation of a cultural system. This conforms with Marx's explanation of historical materialism in the German ideology. There, Marx writes, this mode of production must not be considered simply as being the reproduction of the physical existence of the individuals. Rather, it is a definite form of activity of these individuals, a definite form of expressing their life a definite mode of life on their part.
The unusual feature of Lucas's cultural approach is his identification of rationality itself as a cultural pattern. It is this identification that is enshrined in the concept of reification. The disenchantment of the world Marx described in the Communist Manifesto, where capitalism is attributed an irresistible power to demystify tradition, is fully realized in the lawful character of the capitalist system. The mathematical precision of equal exchange becomes the binding logic of social life, replacing myth and deference to personal authority. Capitalism's rational form, the exchange of equivalents and its laws, replaces earlier non-rational meanings as the structuring principle of social thought and action. Lucas's challenge is explaining opposition to capitalist rationality without resuscitating the irrationality capitalism overcomes. He transforms romantic protest against a rigid conventional order into the philosophical conflict of forms of rationality. There is a distinct advantage to considering reification as a cultural category. Reification is often defined as a mental state, an attitude, but this is not the conception of history and class consciousness. In that work, reification is the underlying unity of the social system the model of all the forms of objectivity of bourgeois society together with all the corresponding forms of subjectivity. Treating human relations as things, the definition of reification is constitutive of capitalist society, an essential aspect of its workings. In his unpublished Defense of History and Class Consciousness, he says this explicitly, although the reference to reification is veiled. The direct forms of appearance of social being are not, however, subjective fantasies of the brain, but moments of the real forms of existence. The point of treating reification as a cultural category is not to deny its economic basis. From the Lucasian perspective, Marxist theory explains the overriding influence of the economy on all sectors of capitalist society rather than simply assuming it a priori on general materialist grounds. A specific feature of the capitalist economy, the commodity form, also functions as the basis of the capitalist cultural system. Economic exchange is the, is the paradigmatic order in which rationality emerges from social practice to become the cultural form of society as a whole. Capitalism is thus the source of cultural system prevailing throughout the social order. What is known as economics, Lucas writes, is nothing but the system of forms of objectivity of real life. This cultural approach is no more reductionist than capitalism itself, a society unique in the cultural significance it assigns the principle of exchange. As Marshall Salins writes, in bourgeois society, material production is the dominant locus of symbolic production. The theory of reification explains how the cultural pattern of capitalism is derived from its economic system and, still more fundamentally, from the practices producing that system. But then the discovery of contradictions in the economic sphere takes on a larger significance. Exploitation is not just an economic issue, but generates a tension between capitalist rationality as a mode of life and working class experience and needs. Class struggle is thus cultural struggle, and what Marx describes as the economic crisis and breakdown of capitalism, Lucas re reconstructs as the system's cultural crisis and breakdown. He thereby, he thereby avoids economism, which derives revolution from simple dissatisfaction with the level of welfare that capitalism can, in theory, deliver to its working class. The transition to a social or the transition to socialism now appears in a different light as well. It is neither a causal sequence nor an ethical exigency, but a process of cultural change. This process arises from the imminent cultural contradictions of capitalism, contradictions between reified social patterns and living human beings who resist the imposition of the reified form, even as they unwittingly reproduce them through their everyday practical activities. Lucas can finally link the philosophical concerns of Marxism with, his, with its analysis of political economy and projection of a socialist future.
The tension he identifies in social reality between its reified form and its living human substratum represents metacritically a larger conflict in the paradigms of rationality. In this conflict, capitalist rationality with its quantitative concept of exchange and social law comes up against a limitation that is overcome theoretically by Marxist dialectics and practically by socialism. Lucas reconceptualizes class struggle as the dialectical mediation in which the formal analytic rationality of capitalism is transcended as a cultural paradigm by an alternative dialectical paradigm. Lucas relates Marxism to the problem of rationality through a revolutionary philosophical interpretation of capital. The preceding chapters have shown how Marx moved from an early critique of formalism in political philosophy to a broader concern with the formalistic concept of reason, very much as Lucas supposed. Although Marx did not explicitly follow up this line of thought in his later work, nevertheless, it is clear that his early metacritique prepared his choice of a dialectical method in economic and social research. Long before the publication of the manuscripts, Lucas discovered that Marx's critique of fetishistic formalism in political economy implies a far more general reconstruction of the concept of reason. Lucas's theory of reification is an original critique of formal rationality based on Marx's capital and pursued to the point where it founds a dialectical concept of reason. There is a sense, then, in which his early Marxist work anticipates the publication of the manuscripts and goes beyond them theoretically. This interpretation of Marxism is controversial. Commentators of the so-called scientific school of Marxism, such as Lucio Coletto and Louis Althusser, protest that Lucas's theory of reification leads back to the romantic culture criticism from which Marx is supposed to have liberated radical social thought. For them, the Lucas Lucasian approach signifies the revival of philosophy, that is to say of ideology, inside the cordon sanitaire surrounding the science of Marxism. The huge intellectual labor through which Lucas freed himself from his youthful romanticism and arrived at an original interpretation of Marxism is simply ignored. Thus, Gareth Stedman Jones writes that history in class consciousness represents the first major eruption of the romantic anti-scientific tradition of bourgeois thought into Marxist theory. Coletti has a similar opinion, complaining that Lucas entered the factory not with capital, but with the essay, essay sur les données immédiates de la conscience. In sum, Lucas transformed the Marxian critique of capitalism into a romantic critique of reason per se by conceptualizing formal rationality through the concept of reification, rather than considering such rationality in the approved scientific manner as a universal feature of knowledge as such. But Lucas had no need to study Bergson to arrive at his intellectual destination. Marx and Hegel would have sufficed, nor Pace Coletti is his understanding of modern technology so very different from Marx's that it would justify the label of romantic it is acquired in the course of numerous polemics. There is ample material in the first volume of Capital to support his critique of the alienating effects of the division and mechanization of labor. Lucas no more than Marx is hostile to machinery per se, as is sometimes charged. Nor is Lucas opposed to reason in general, but like Hegel, he rejects the universal pretensions of formal rationality in order to validate the claims of dialectical rationality. What really is questionable in his procedure is also what is most original and fruitful, namely the discovery that linking all the phenomena of capitalist society Marx criticizes from fetishism to mechanization and crises there is a common structure, a pattern constituted by the imposition of formal rationality on the social world. It is this discovery that is the basis for Lucas's generalization of Marx's approach in the theory of reification. This, rather than any retreat into irrationalism inspired by mauvaise lecture, is what lies behind the introduction of the concept of reification,
and its application in a cultural critique of capitalism. Lucas's leap from the critique of political economy to a theory of capitalist culture is a daring step beyond Marx made possible by the change in the intellectual and social landscape since Marx's day. Reification as a sociological category. For Lucas, the crisis of reason encompasses the dominant paradigm of rationality in all its manifestations, from science and technology to the market and the bureaucracy and even the socialist opposition itself. The concept of reification that Lucas applies in all these domains is based on multiple sources. Marx's critique of machine industry in his concept of commodity fetishism, Simmel's and Weber's concepts of the exchange society, bureaucracy and rationalization, and Hegel's dialectical concept of appearance. To these, in, to these overt influences, I would add the subtler impact of neo-Kantian philosophy, especially Emil Lask's concept of meaning. Lucas's theory can best be understood as a generalization of Marxian theory in two dimensions, in sociological breadth through Weber and in ontological depth through neo-Kantianism and Hegel. So generalized, the concept of reification becomes the basis for a critique of capitalist rationality as a worldview and a system logic threatened by its inability to grasp the material substratum of its own formalistic categories and institutional structures. According to Lucas, commodity exchange is the basis of all forms of reification. He seeks the Sainsgrund of reified thought even in its highest philosophical manifestations in the structure of the market. In Capital, Marx explains the market in terms of the fetishism of commodities. By this peculiar expression, he means the substitution of exchange value for use value, relations between social objects for relations between the human beings who produce them both in everyday life and in the scientific representation of the economy. Fetishism characterizes a society in which the economic relations between the individuals are governed by the forces they unleash through their unplanned market interactions. In such a society, the law of the market takes on an independence and power, a material character. The individuals themselves increasingly lose. This is due to the fact that production and exchange are splintered and fragmented. Marx writes, In the form of society now under consideration, the behavior of men in the social process of production is purely atomic. Hence, the relations to each other in production assume a material character independent of their control and conscious individual action. These facts manifest themselves at first by products as a general rule taking the form of commodities. Marx calls the result fetishism because the human relations of producers and consumers appear not as such, but as relations between economic goods and categories, which latter seem to have an effect, an effective dynamism independent of the individuals. The myriad interactions of individuals on the market, which none can chart, although all contribute their share appear as specifically economic properties attached to the goods in circulation. Thus, goods have a price that seems to belong to them much as do their physical and chemical properties. Indeed, so real is their price that it effectively governs the movement of the goods. Similarly, some goods are capital, which others take the form of profit or wages or savings and so on. Yet it is clear that while these categories are in no sense imaginary, neither are they real attributes of the things to which they are applied. They are, says Marx, social relations become things or reified. A commodity is therefore a mysterious thing simply because in it the social character of men's labor appears to them as an objective character stamped upon the product of that labor. Because the relation of the producers to the sum total of their labors presented to them as a social relation existing not between themselves, but between the product of their labor, the products of their labor. <laughs>
Although Lucas initially grounds his account of reification in these considerations on the market, amplified by reference to Simmel's sociology of money, in the course of his discussion, he adds an additional explanation in terms of the capitalist transformation of the work process. Capitalism everywhere divorces workers from their means of production and organizes them in factories. The reification of labor becomes the model of reification throughout the society. The destiny of the worker becomes the general destiny of the entire society. Labor thus has new social and ideological functions in capitalist society, different in principle from those it possessed in earlier times. It is no longer a special concern of a particular state as in slave and feudal society. Labor is not seen as a degraded subhuman activity, but as the source of all social utility as an eminently human occupation. Not only do ordinary people labor, the capitalist class itself justifies its right to possess the means of production by claiming that they are the fruit of its labor. This is not merely ideology. The key traits of reification workers experience also affect the upper classes. The problems of consciousness arising from wage labor are repeated in the ruling class in a refined and spiritualized, but for that very reason, more intensified form. Under capitalism, the means of production face the worker as an independent system that imposes its own rhythm and order. The more advanced the mechanization, the more the expenditure of labor power becomes the simple control of the autonomous productive activity of the machines themselves. Here work becomes the contemplative stance adopted toward a process mechanically conforming to fixed laws, enacted independently of man's consciousness and impervious to human intervention, i.e. a perfectly closed system. The capitalist too confronts reified reality. His much vaunted entrepreneurial creativity, says Lucas, consists entirely in calculating as exactly as possible what will happen despite his own intervention. The capitalist then attempts to so position himself with respect to this predetermined outcome that he can profit from the objective evolution. Like the worker confronted with the autonomous machine, the capitalist confronts the autonomous market. The machine's reified appearance of autonomy and rationality obscures the fact that they are products of human labor, that their essence is not to be found merely in the structure of their operations, but also in the human activity that first created them and gave them that structure. What is true of the machine is also true of the market and at a higher level of generality of society as a whole. In short, obscured behind the rational structure of the productive system is the collective activity underlying social reality. The activity of the individual subject in capitalist society cannot transform that reality in Lucas's ontological sense of the term, but rather conforms to it, and especially to its laws, in order to realize its potential benefits. The intervention of this subject is exhausted in taking up an orientation with respect to an ultimately unchangeable reality. Where this orienting activity is multiplied many times over, massive regularities of behavior appear that may indeed have a significant effect, effect on the real world. But the subjects do not assume this effect as their common creation but rather relate to it as the presupposition of an individual calculus of losses and gains. Thus, the attitude of the subject becomes purely contemplative in the philosophical sense. Bureaucratization is a further consequence of the capitalist organization of labor. The division of labor disrupts the unity of every social process, not just those associated with industrial production. Specializations emerge that each address one or another fragment of social life. These specializations gain a certain autonomy and as a result, their objects too become increasingly independent of each other. This centrifugal, mo uh, this centrifugal movement results in a disjunction between the bureaucracies and the reality of the society. Lucas follows in Weber's footsteps in treating these aspects of reification as results of rationalization.
The theory of rational rationalization has to do with the extension of formalistic quantifying reason to social life. Weber links this process to Protestantism, which presided over the emergence of capitalism and the scientific quantification of nature that contributes to the secularization of modern culture. The capitalist orientation toward economic gain and the scientific spirit are joined in the idea of society as an object of technical control. This idea is fully realized in the bureaucratic system. Lucas incorporates Weber's theory wholesale into his own, wherever quality appears as quantity, or human interaction appears as the interaction between social things, or the course of social events appears to be determined by quasi-natural laws, he finds evidence of reification. Lucas's originality with respect to Weber lies in his emphasis on the tension between the formal structure of rationalization and the actual human content of social life on which it is imposed. Lucas thus borrows ideas from Weber, but treats them in the general framework of Marx's critique of fetishism as a formal rational appearance and dialectical conflict with an underlying reality. One might almost say that Weber's theory is recast by Lucas in the mold of Marx's, so that its general tendency is reversed, no longer an account of the inexorable progress of rationalization's iron cage. Lucas's refurbished Weberianism sets this trend off against a dialectical counter trend that promises eventual release from rationalization. In Lucas, social reality escapes from the net of reified rationality. The increasing rationality of the parts is tied, he claims, to the invincible irrationality of the total process, to economic crisis and violent resistance from below. With this approach, he has the basis of a specifically Marxist theory of the culture and crisis of capitalism, developed later in many dimensions by other Marxists, especially the Frankfurt School. Reification as an ontological concept. Lucas's essay on reification opens with the statement that the structure of commodity relations can be made to yield a model of all the forms of objectivity of bourgeois society and all the corresponding forms of subjectivity. Lucas describes reification with a peculiarly ambiguous term. Oh shit. Oh. Gegenstandlichkeit's form or form of objectivity. This term unfortunately disappears from the English translation and is everywhere rendered by circumlocutions that obscure its philosophical significance. That significance can only be grasped against the background of the Neo Kantian debates in which Lucas himself was involved a few years before he became a Marxist. The trace of these debates is very much present in history and class consciousness. This is the link between Lucas's sociological concept of reification and the philosophical problematic of rationality. The Neo-Kantian reference complicates the interpretation of the passage quoted at the beginning of this section. What does Lucas mean here by a model? Is he referring to an analogy or a cause? If commodity relations are analogically homologous to forms of objectivity and subjectivity, then we must seek elsewhere for the cause of both. The theory of reification might then lead to an idealistic explanation of some sort, for example, a flaw in the spirit of modernity. But if commodity relations cause objects and subjects to take a reified form, then Lucas would appear to have lapsed into crude economic determinism. The, interpreted, the interpretative problem stems from the unspecified concept of form of objectivity. This Neo-Kantian term implies a transcendental account of meaning that Lucas never explicitly develops. Dilthey and his Neo-Kantian contemporaries all emphasized the distinctiveness of cultural and historical phenomena. The irreducible individuality of events defies, or defies sorry, attempts to order them under 
um, under laws such as those of the natural sciences. The concept of Verstehen or interpretive or um, interpretive understanding familiar from Weberian sociology is a social alternative to natural scientific explanation. The object of interpretation is meaning or validity as the Neo-Kantians called it. Meaning is not bare physical existence, but that aspect of things through which they are intelligible, make sense, are known, belong to a culture. In this account of the conditions of cultural intellig intelligibility, meaning is derived from the intentions of the subject. Husserl would soon radicalize this approach in a new form of transcendental idealism. The Neo-Kantian philosopher Emil Lask was also a significant influence on both Heidegger and Lucas because he began the move from a transcendental to an ontological theory of meaning. Lask's concept of meaning as form is developed in his transcendental theory of logic. Is developed in his transcendental theory of logic. A brief account of this theory is essential to understanding Lucas. Lask argues that meanings are ordered under categories in regional ontologies that define domains of objects. This is easily illustrated by academic fields, although not confined to them. The object of physics is matter in motion. The meaning with which it is concerned are specified by these terms. By contrast, the object of English literature is a canon of poetry and prose, classics, Certain works have meaning as objects of study in this context. These general categories are Gegenstand Lickitsfermen. <laughs> Every sphere of existence has its own such category. We could, for example, extend the concept to the tools in a workshop, as did Heidegger in his related analysis of meaning. Lask's notion of meaning is difficult to grasp because we normally confound meanings with the things that have meaning. There are a few experiences in which the distinction can be more easily apprehended. Consider, for example, the case of photographic representation. When we are asked what we see in a picture of a horse, we are likely to reply a horse. But of course we are looking at a piece of photographic paper, not a horse. The meaning of the picture is distinct from its existence. But this is an adequate example since photographic paper is also a meaning. If we showed the picture to a cat, it would not see a horse or photographic paper, but something to bat around or sit on. It is not clear that even this constitutes an unmediated relation to existence, yet such a relation is an essential postulate of Lask's theory. Lask's ontology has two divisions, existence and meaning, but nothing can be said about existence outside the context of one or another meaning that forms it. And Lask does not explain the origin of the forms. They are neither material things nor metaphysical entities. They are pure transcendental conditions of realms of objects. But unlike Dilthey, Husserl, and earlier Neo-Kantian philosophers, Lask does not attribute such conditions to the subject. Lask died in World War I at the age of 39, his work still incomplete. No doubt he would have addressed this lacuna had he lived. In any case, it inspired Heidegger and Lucas, who both accepted Lask's breakthrough to a new kind of transcendental account of meaning that borders on ontology. Meaning is the being of the phenomena through which we gain access to them as what they are. Heidegger and Lucas went on to attempt to ground being in practice rather than subjectivity. Lask's terminology suggests this solution. He argues that the meanings or validities hold of particular entities through the form of those entities and form is nothing other than a particular objective. But when about bewandness involvement pertaining to the material. Involvements are articulated in judgments. This is a hammer. But Lask believes they are already present in the world before any judgments are made. 
Normally, we live with the meaningful entities we experience without thematizing meaning as such. How often do we say this is a hammer when we see one, and yet we always know perfectly well what we are looking at? The operative intelligib intelligibility of experience is the basis of the possibility of judgment and knowledge. Philosophical understanding of meaning requires a departure from the lived relation to it in the adoption of a transcendental perspective that focuses on the form in which things are given in experience. In very different ways, Heidegger and Lucas showed how objects and subjects acquire meaning in a social world, conceived as a totality of involvements through the practices of that world. They both seek an ontologically founding practical relation to meaning in a domain of real existence. Something ontic in the world must found the world as the totality of involvement, the ontological. <coughs> the chief difference between them is that for Heidegger, the all-important something is the everyday practical activity of individual desin. <coughs> Whereas for Lucas, it is the collective practices associated with the economic system. In Heidegger's case, this practical ground was explained in a fundamental ontology of phenomenological inspiration. In his workshop analysis, the notion of bewantness is nicely developed in terms of the arrangement, relevance, or involvement of the material itself, i.e. the connections between the various tools and the work that grants the meaning qua tools. A hammer out of all connection with nails, boards, and the idea of carpentry could not properly be called a hammer. It would lack the contextual preconditions of its meaning. It would just be an oddly shaped, unintelligible thing. Lucas responded to the lacuna with an account of the role of economic practices in establishing the conditions of meaning throughout bourgeois society. He offers a quasi-functional account, arguing that the meaning of each social entity is determined by its relation to the whole. And he adds that the intelligibility of objects develops in proportion as we grasp their function in the totality to which they belong. Every substantial change that is of concern to knowledge manifests itself as a change in the form of objectivity of every object of cognition. Marx has formulated this idea in countless places. I shall cite only one of the best known passages. A black man is a black man. He only becomes a slave in certain circumstances. A cotton spinning jenny is a machine for spinning cotton. Only in certain circumstances does it become capital. Torn from these circumstances, it is no more capital than gold is money, or sugar the price of sugar. Lucas concludes that the totality is a higher reality than the isolated facts. In it, the processual essence of society achieves validity, i.e. takes on its true meaning. Lucas's methodology is clearly delineated in these passages. Particular social objects are to be understood in terms of their economic involvements. They cannot be understood in isolation, but only in relation to the whole because that relation is constituting for their meaning. At the highest level of generality, the whole is characterized by the reification associated with the commodity form. A hierarchy of categories is implied in this approach, leading from particular to universal features of the totality. As a form of objectivity, reification is in the first instance practical rather than theoretical. In constantly buying and selling commodities, including intellectual products, or working in mechanized industries, or engaging with bureaucratic administrations, the members of a capitalist society live the reified relationships that construct that society. The reif reified form of objectivity of the society gives coherence and meaning to social objects arising from and feeding back into the practical relationship to those objects, and it shapes the corresponding subjectivity of the atomized actors. <laughs>
This is what Lucas means when he says that commodity relations are the model of the forms of objectivity and subjectivity in bourgeois society. The performativity, the performativity of practice grants a single overriding form to the whole society, the form of thinghood. Form and content. But the story of Lask's influence on Lucas is not finished with these observations. Lask's theory of meaning was intended to solve a fundamental problem in Kant's philosophy, the problem of the thing in itself. Lask's interpretation of the transcendental differed from, the, from Kant's in that Lask did not propose a principle of mental synthesis by which forms would join with the content of sense, of, sense experience. He dismissed the whole Kantian philosophical psychology and argued that the forms are independent of the mind. As subjects, we are in immediate contact with a meaningful world. That world has its meaning in itself, not in our minds. But, but meaning, as we have seen, is not identical with existence. The forms form a content that emerges with them from the original unity of the existing thing. This content is not a separate thing, for everything is grasped through its meaning. Rather, the content is simply that which is so grasped. The easiest way to understand this is in terms of point of view. I apprehend a cup under the meaning cup, but the content so apprehended could also inhabit other forms, for example, Wedgwood, or physical determinants such as weight and volume. What is more, the meaning cup could itself appear as a content for a higher level meaning such as dinnerware, or an entirely different meaning such as three-letter words. In each case, the content is formed by the meaning, but not, exhaust not exhausted by it. Lask calls this contingent relation of form and content the rationality of content. This is his reinterpretation of the Kantian thing in itself. In Kant, the thing in itself hovers inconclusively on the border between the ontic and the ontological. It is unclear if it really is a thing or hypothetical precondition of sensation. The ambiguity reflects a gap between form and content Kant formulated as the limitation of finite human knowledge to objects of experience. Experience is rational, i.e. meaningful, insofar as it is imprinted by the forms of understanding but its matter ultimately escapes the forms. In Lask, this tension is reduced to a shadow of itself. The rationality of content is simply the trace left by the contingency of the relation of meaning to existence. The fact that no particular entity is destined to any one specific meaning. Lask argued that Hegel attempted to encompass the irrational existence of things in his system of categories. But this emanationist logic fails because existence cannot be deduced from concepts. The irrational is the necessary correlate of the rational. The principle of the irrationality of contents is also central to Lucas's theory of reification. And he joins Lask in rejecting emanationism. But he does not accept Lask's explanation of irrationality. Instead, he introduces an entirely new approach to the problem of the contents of the forms that shatters the structure of Lask's theory. Lucas historicizes the form, content, dialectic, and treats the structure of meaning at the highest level of generality as a cultural form, as the principle of intelligibility of an epoch. As we have seen, reification characterizes the capitalist epoch, but in redefining form as a cultural principle in this sense, Lucas undermines Lask's characterization of content as a purely logical correlate. Content no longer, or content no longer stands in an ideal relation to its form, but now acquires a real relationship to it. Objects enter culture through social processes that can be studied and understood. What is more, tensions between objects and their forms can be observed and analyzed. The concept of the irrational contents of the forms now takes on a fact factical power Lask would never have allowed. These modifications of Lask's schema 
have two consequences that Lucas develops in the second and third parts of the reification essay. In the first place, Lucas recasts the history of modern philosophy in terms of the tensions between form and content. In the second place, he extends the argument to the living practical basis of the reified form of objectivity of capitalist society. As we will see in more detail in the next chapter, Lucas applies his cultural approach to the analysis of the history of modern philosophy. He argues that modern philosophy identifies rationality with the reified form of objectivity of bourgeois society and then attempts to overcome the irrationality of the contents of the rational form through deducing them from concepts. Why was bourgeois philosophy interested in overcoming the gap between form and content theoretically? According to Lucas, what is at stake is the vindication of the claim of rationality to embrace domains of being assigned to irrational forces such as royalty and religion in earlier societies. The ambition of the bourgeoisie to escape from the worldly power of the representatives of these forces requires it to extend its conception of rationality beyond all limits, at least in theory. Lucas relates this ambition to Vico's famous virum factum principle, according to which we can only fully understand what we have ourselves created. But this principle comes to grief because of the formal character of rationality. The history of classical German philosophy shows the failure of the project of modern philosophy. The content of its of its formal rationality escapes all attempts to encompass it fully within the forms. The contingency of the world remains and is conceptualized in the thing in itself. Formal rational disciplines such as mathematics and natural science cannot grasp their contents. That is to say the purely contingent or factical objects to which they refer. The limitation is self-evident in the relation of formal laws to the particulars to which they apply. An abstract formula such as distance equals velocity time, times time cannot account for the existence of its objects, only their relations once they have been conceptualized on the terms of the law. Similarly, a representation such as a map is useless until the person holding it has been oriented to the particular environment in which she is situated. The gap between form and content is not merely a philosophical challenge. It also has a practical side. In practical life, this gap cannot be closed by simply squeezing contents into the available forms. This limitation has never bothered physicists in the application of their formulae or geographers employing their maps. For them, the relation of form and content is purely theoretical, but it ends up posing problems in daily life when forms actually form their content. Then it matters practically whether the forms are adequate to fully embrace their content. We are familiar with the unfortunate consequences of attempts to force the issue, bureaucracies that make no allowance for individual circumstances, laws the strict enforcement of which is unjust, work to rule strikes, teaching to tests, technical interfaces and manuals that require users to think like engineers, and so on. In practice, common sense treats forms as resources in the context of activities oriented toward a type of content rather than, an ab than as absolutes. We know very well that the map is not the territory, but it is useful nevertheless once we find our bearings but Lucas holds that modern capitalist society is a gigantic instance of economic and social forms imposed blindly on content. The commodity form prevails regardless of whether it is successfully medi whether it successfully mediates the distribution of use values or leaves masses in starvation. The formal economic laws fail to embrace the concrete content of economic life. Say's law can serve as an illustration. It holds that the total supply of goods and services in a free market economy will equal the total demand at any given time. This law is contradicted by economic crises in which a glut of goods outspaces demand, bankrupting producers and impoverishing workers.
Administration and law ride roughshod over the human cases that tread under unbending rules. Technology imposes its rhythms regardless of the worker's misery and the waste of their potential. The rationality of the system is fundamentally irrational from the standpoint of content, and that content is human. The quantification of objects, their subordination to abstract mental categories makes its appearance in the life of the worker immediately as a process of abstraction of which he is the victim. The Lucician crisis theory is concerned with the generalization and breakdown of formal rationality as the governing principle of capitalist social life. The crisis appears in the conflict between existence and its immediacy together with its expression in thought in the categories of reflection and living social reality. Here we once again encounter the contradiction Marx identified between true actuality and existing actuality. Lucas argues that bourgeois political economy is the immediate theor theoretical expression of the social structure, that is, of existence in its immediacy. Its formal rational character contradicts living social reality. Lucas explains the emergence of political economy in terms of the relative success of the bourgeoisie in imposing its reified categories on actual social life. Nor is it an accident that economics became an independent discipline under capitalism. Thanks to its commodity and trade arrangements, capitalist society has given the whole of economic life an identity notable for its autonomy, its cohesion, and its reliance on imminent laws. This was something quite unknown in earlier forms of society. But even this relative success of capitalist economic theory and practice meets its limit in, in, in inevitable resistance from below. Thus, for Lucas, formal rationality enters it into crisis at two levels. Epistemologically, in the ultimate failure of capitalist economic and social categories adequately to grasp the content of social life, and socio-politically in the failure of the objects of these categories, the real institutions and relations they reflect adequately to shape the lives of human beings in the society. Nevertheless, Lucas insists that political economy is not simply wrong. It formulates more or less exact calculations and predictions in every sphere of abandoning qualitative explanations for quantitative ones. Partial abstract systems of laws can be constructed, each one embracing a specific segment of the economy in a form that allows it to be successfully manipulated for individual advantage. But the strength of this method is also its limit. Universal and atemporal laws, such as those of political economy, cannot grasp the practices that constitute social reality in its lawful regularity. While partial social subsystems such as enterprises and bureaucratic administrations are highly rationalized, the interactions between them are irrational in the sense that they are not organized and planned as they would be under socialism. The sum of the rationalized domains does not add up to the totality. Thus, political economy cannot comprehend those shifts and transformations at the level of the totality in which the foundations of the social system are laid and changed. The whole structure of capitalist production rests on the interaction between a necessity, subject, um, I lost my spot, a necessity subject to strict laws and all isolated phenomena, and the relative irrationality of the total process. This irrationality of the total process is reflected in the economic crises of capitalism in which Lucas sees an unconscious rebellion of use value against the exchange value that is its phenomenal form. The reified form here fails to mediate successfully the production and distribution of the real contents, use values, needed to maintain the system and the individuals who live under it. This same irrationality appears consciously in the class struggle. Reification constrains human life processes without always fulfilling human needs or performing the sense-making function that constitutes stable objects. Life overflows rationalization in every direction and comes back to haunt the rationalized domains in the course of class struggles. These struggles reveal the human basis of the society that has been shaped but also repressed by the reified forms.
This provokes reflexive processes unknown in nature. Human lives considered as content of the reified forms have an independent power not just to violate expectations but also to understand themselves as doing so. This resistant self-understanding constitutes the core of what Lucas, following Marx, calls class consciousness. The process of abstraction in which wage labor consists cuts the worker off from his labor power, forcing him to sell it on the market as a commodity belonging to him. And by selling this, his only commodity, he integrates it and himself, for his commodity is inseparable from his physical existence into a specialized process that has been rationalized and mechanized, a process that he discovers already existing, complete and able to function without him, and in which he is no more than a cipher reduced to an abstract quantity, a mechanized and rationalized tool. The quantitative differences in exploitation which appear to the capitalist in the form of quantitative determinants of the objects of his calculation must appear to the worker as the decisive qualitative categories of his whole physical, mental, and moral existence. As can be seen from this passage, Lucas is more interested in the alienation of the working class than in its motivations. The brief reference here to the worker's physical, mental, and moral existence, so damaged by capitalism, refers us to the self-evident focus of generations of labor struggle and socialist political work. He takes for granted critical awareness of poverty, de-skilled de labor, and the indignities and injustices of life for the lower classes. These conditions appear as content of the reified forms, not for any intrinsic reason, but simply because in generating them, capitalism forms them inadequately, producing poverty in terms of wages, de-skilling as technical progress, and indignities and injustices as well deserved consequences of personal failings. Obviously, this aspect of Lucas's argument appears inadequate today. We would like to know how what might be called the, the facticity of the working class enters consciousness, by what process it becomes the basis for resistance and revolt. Lucas's rather limited account is explained in his theory of class consciousness discussed in the appendix of this book. In any case, the situation of the proletariat gives rise to what Lucas calls the self-consciousness of the commodity a bizarre hybrid of the human and the non-human. Philosophy and revolutionary theory are joined most intimately in this concept, but Lucas notes that the mere fact of self-consciousness is not revolutionary. A slave does not modify his status or society in recognizing the fact of his own slavery. What is different about the worker? The fact that the worker's self-knowledge brings about an objective structural change in the object of knowledge. Beneath the cloak of the thing lay a relation between men. Beneath the quantifying crust, there was a qualitative living core. Now that, now that this core is revealed, it becomes possible to recognize the fetish character of every commodity. Capitalism is uniquely exposed to practical critique by its own members. No previous economic system was so vulnerable. This is because the existence of capitalism depends on the members of the society conceiving themselves as individual agents, interacting through objective systems such as markets. They must adopt, adopt a contemplative attitude and seek personal advantage in these systems. In sum, the reified structuration of the society depends on reified practice. Capitalism has a reified form of objectivity that is perceived and acted upon in a reified disposition, closing the circle of social construction. When it breaks down, the system is threatened. The reified form of objectivity of the society is shattered from within. The workers as private owners of a commodity called labor power are transformed by self-consciousness into a potentially revolutionary force. The individualistic form of life imposed by capitalism based on technical manipulation oh no technical manipulation technical manip in conformity with the laws of the system gives way to collective and conscious choice the act of consciousness overthrows the form of objectivity of its objects lucas thus distinguishes what i call a transforming practice from a contemplative or reified practice
In class struggle, economic, political, and social acts react profoundly on each other, unlike the rigorous separation between them in bourgeois theory and practice. This constitutes an immediate refutation of the reified point of view. Force appears as the concrete embodiment of the rationality limiting capitalism, rationality of the intermittence of its laws. To the bourgeoisie, the result appears as imminent barbarism and social disintegration. Lucas argues, on the contrary, that it is the uncomprehended content of that abstract labor power the capitalist pays at the factory gate, shattering its own reified form of objectivity and manifesting itself directly in historical action. Here, the totality as the actual moving force of history, the reality behind the reified appearances, emerges independently of the social laws and confronts them with forces they cannot control. Reification and Reason The full significance of Lucas's theory of reification can only be understood by examining its roots in Hegel. In his later defense of history and class consciousness, Lucas writes that Hegel's true philosophy of society is his logic of essence, because unbeknownst to Hegel, of course, here the real laws of movement, the real social being of bourgeois society, mirror themselves conceptually. Thus, if Marx, in overturning Hegel's philosophy, has at the same time rescued its real core, then he precisely rescued most from the logic of essence, demythologized, of course. Lucas's claim is justified by Marx's frequent use of the Hegelian category of appearance, elaborated in the doctrine of essence. Unfortunately, this is one of the most difficult aspects of Hegel's thought. Marx's appropriation of Hegel's concept of essence in his economic theory also defies simple exposition. For the purpose of this account of Lucas's theory of reification, it is not necessary to summarize the, these discussions since he paints the Hegel-Marx relation with a broad brush. I will focus primarily on an exoteric presentation of Hegel's position in a short essay entitled Who Thinks Abstractly? This essay helps to understand the most important aspect of Hegel's theory relevant to Marx and especially to Lucas's interpretation of Marx. Hegel argues in this essay for reversing the usual understanding of abstract and concrete. It is not the philosopher who thinks abstractly, but the ordinary person who summarizes a complex of relationships in a single trait. Abstraction is thus a cynic doc in which a part stands for the concrete whole. Hegel gives the example of the servant who is treating or who is treated as merely a servant by a vulgar master in contrast with the French noble who understands that his servant has ideas and purposes just like himself and who relates to him accordingly as a person. In this simplified version, Hegel's idea is obviously relevant to Marxist economics. Take the example of commodity exchange. It is made possible by abstracting a specific economic relation from the complex human and material relations that surround it. We enter a store and approach the clerk exclusively as a clerk, ignoring all other aspects of the clerk's being. We buy the product without any knowledge of its producers or how it came to be in the store. The objects and persons we encounter in the economic exchanges of capitalist society can be considered abstractions from the wider whole of the social world in which they are embedded. What is abstracted is the dimension of the social world through which it is commodified and controlled. In the science of logic, a much more elaborate discussion of the relation of abstract to concrete is formulated in terms of the concept of appearance. In Hegel's sense, appearance is not in the mind, but is the immediate reality of essence. The form in which it reveals itself proximally. Appearances are abstract in Hegel's sense not in terms of conceptual generality, but as unilateral aspects of a more complex whole. That whole consists not only in appearances, but also in the internal relations between them that make up a whole. 
Hegel explores many different relations between appearances, the most important of which, for Lucas's argument, is the law of appearance. Hegel's concept of law is drawn from natural science. He does not reject science, but he does reject its claim to arrive at the true essence of the appearances. Law achieves only immediate because abstract unity between appearances. By this he means that the, di that the different appearances related by law retain their independence of each other, even within their relation. For example, the formula introduced earlier equating distance with velocity times time does not unify space and time, even as it relates them. The appearances and the law are thus abstract partial moments. Hegel requires something more, a concrete totality that effectively unifies appearances and a mutually dependent whole. In the A Contribution to the Critique of Political Economy, Marx translates these Hegelian notions into his own language. He distinguishes the concrete of thought from the reality it represents in order to avoid any idealistic confusion between the two. Marx offers this materialist qualification simply to clarify his own appropriation of the Hegelian concepts. He writes in a famous passage, the concrete is concrete because it is a combination of many objects with different destinations, i.e. a unity of diverse elements. In our thought, it therefore appears as a process of synthesis, as a result and not as a starting point although it is the real starting point and therefore also the starting point of observation and conception. In other words, it may seem that the concepts we use to understand the real constitute it, but in fact the real is always already synthetic in itself, a unity of diverse elements presupposed by our thought. The true intellectual synthesis that brings together all the various categories of the capitalist economy its appearances in a concrete totality in the Hegelian sense overcomes their unilateral character by explaining their historical origins, social functions, and relations. The law-governed appearances of the capitalist economy analyzed in bourgeois economics can be unified more fundamentally through explanations that reveal the mutual constitution of such things as capital, labor, money, machinery, and ultimately the relations and forces of production. So Marx writes that the categories are therefore but forms of expression, manifestations of existence of this subject, this definite society, i.e. the concrete reality from which they have been abstracted. So far, Marx seems to add little to Hegel's concept of the abstract and the concrete, but another aspect of his position marks a definite departure. Marx's theory of fetishism appears to rely on the conventional distinction between the abstract and the concrete to describe the process in which money appears as the general equivalent for all economic goods. Here is Alfred Sonrethel's description of this real abstraction underlying the capitalist economy. The form of the commodity is abstract and abstractness governs its whole orbit. To begin with, exchange value is itself abstract value in contrast to the use value of commodities. The exchange value is subject only to quantitative differentiation, and this quantification is again abstract compared with the quantity which measures use values. Marx points out with particular emphasis that even labor, when determining the magnitude and substance of value, becomes abstract human labor, human labor purely as such. The form in which commodity value takes on its concrete appearance as money, be it as coinage or banknotes, is an abstract thing which, strictly speaking, is a contradiction in terms. While Son Rethel focuses on exchange, his remarks hint at a second and more fundamental real abstraction, labor. The purely quantitative identity of all commodities is ultimately rooted in the equivalence of the labor they contain. Under capitalism, the comparability of all the forms of labor, their abstract identity, in the conventional sense of the term, is not merely theoretical, but is realized practically in the transformation of the labor process. Labor is systematically de-skilled. It loses its concrete character as a complex performance.
the qualitative specificity of the various types of craft labor is eliminated, and all are reduced to the mere quantitative expenditure of energy. The result is the emergence of work as an economic category with a simple quantitative measure in terms of time. The real abstraction of labor is the basis of the real abstraction of price. Political economy, Marx argues, is the system of categories describing such real abstractions. The facts of social life are raised to consciousness in its categories and comprehended through its formal rational laws. These latter are not illusion or ideology, nor are they reality in the full sense of the term. Rather, they are the law of appearance in Hegel's sense. But as such, they do not comprehend the essential relations that describe the society as a concrete totality. For that the abstract categories of the economy would have to be explained in terms of the underlying social relations. Thus, Marx's use of the conventional distinction is embedded in a Hegelian dialectic of appearance and reality. Marx's method condenses the two concepts of the abstract and the concrete, the conventional and the dialectical, into one. He shows that abstractness in the sense of conceptual genera generality, at least in the case of the commodity and labor, is the necessary form of appearance of the concrete social reality of capitalism. But this conjunction is precisely the substance of Lucas's theory of reification. Lucas's starting point is the appearance of autonomy of the economy and modeled on it other apparently autonomous social institutions. Society appears as a collection of independent social things ruled by the laws of the differentiated domains. These things are comprehended by social science as facts. The facts appear as facts insofar as they are abstracted from the whole, separated from each other, reduced to quantitative determinants, and stripped of the many mysteries that characterized similar entities in pre-capitalist society. This apparent factuality of the social world is the form in which it is revealed in that aspect that has a systematic order, a lawful form. So much is clear from the earlier discussion of reification, but it is easy to pass over Lucas's deeper insight. The real abstraction of the capitalist economic categories does not merely describe the facts, superficially understood. This would be to underestimate the significance of reification by overlooking the problematic status of factuality itself. What does it mean that social entities have the form of facts? It is unlikely that members of pre-capitalist societies would find a factual description of the foundations of their social world reasonable or salient. Of course, they would be quite capable of such reifying procedures as counting or measuring particular objects where appropriate. But that is a far cry from understanding their origins, the cosmos, the founding myths of their society, the relations between the ages, and sexes in terms of what we call facts. Even we find factual description inadequate to such things as our close human relationships. No factuality or no factuality is not a self-evident category. It must be constructed in the social world to which it is effectively relevant. This is the deepest function of the concept of reification. It is meant to explain how the world can appear as a collection of facts. The process of reification is the ontological foundation of the factuality of the social world. It is constitutive of the facts, their factuality as their form of objectivity. This insight explains why Lucas had to give up romantic critique. His theory of reification will not allow him to simply counterpose social and economic law to the claims of personality, nor can he demand a return from the lawful order of the facts to immediate experience. The problem of modernity goes deeper to the ontological foundations. It cannot be addressed at the level of the soul and its passions, which are merely reflexes of the Gradgrindian factuality of the world. The Sunday worship of what is excluded the rest of the week. Rather, trans transcendence must be sought at the level of the structuring forces that shape the form of objectivity of the social world. Lucas identifies those forces with the proletariat, which actually constructs the social world through its labor. This identification suggests another similarity between Marxism and Hegel. Hegel reconstructed Kant's 
contrast between understanding and reason, verstand and vernunft, to signify the difference between scientific research and speculative philosophical insight. In Hegel, the two are related as stages in the acquisition of knowledge. The phenomenology of spirit contains an important account of the relation that has a remarkable similarity to Lucas's argument. Hegel explores the attempt of science to understand the appearance of nature as the product of essential forces governed by law. This attempt fails to explain the law of these forces and ultimately leads to the starting or startling discovery that the whole contrast of appearance and essence depends ultimately on self-consciousness. Hegel writes, it is manifest that behind the so-called curtain, which is supposed to conceal the inner world, there is nothing to be seen unless we go behind it ourselves, as much in order that we may see, as that there may be something behind there which can be seen. In contemporary Hegel scholarship, this argument is interpreted to demonstrate the soci sociality of knowledge. As Terry Pinkard puts it, with Hegel, we move away from a representationalist picture of knowledge to the idea of socially situated reason giving activities. We thus move away from the picture of ourselves as subjects representing the world to an understanding of ourselves as participants in various historically determinate social practices. But what if this social we of knowledge is divided by class and enters into conflict not only over particular material stakes, but over those historically determinate social practices. In that case, both appearances and the self-consciousness behind them take on practical functions in a struggle over meaning. There's another significant difference between this Marxist and the original Hegelian approach, where in Hegel the contrast of understanding and reason is an atemporal distinction in ontological levels. Lucas explains it historically. Marxism shows that history consists precisely in the constant transformation of those forms which earlier modes of thinking, undialectical and stuck fast in the immediacy of their present as they always were, regarded as supra-historical. Supra the theory of reification applies this approach to bourgeois culture. This culture takes as supra-historical the form of analytic understanding corresponding to the actual categorical structure of the economy that is its archetype and source. The identification of rationality as such with this form explains its general predominance in philosophy, the sciences, law, and administration. Marx's critique of political economy thus becomes the basis for a more general critique of formal rationality. The sphere of appearance which consists for Marx in the reified facts of capitalism is bounded historically by a possible transcendence in action. The self-consciousness that overthrows capitalism is not Geist, but the class consciousness of the proletariat. Reification is thus not subjective, but neither is it an eternally unchanging reality. It is the failure to grasp reification as social appearance that leads to its philosophical representation as an eternal foundation of knowledge and experience, rather than as a historically specific cultural form. With this discovery, the boundaries between history and philosophy break down. Philosophy now appears as implicated in history rather than giving access to the eternal. Philosophy arises from the contradictions of the apparently super-historical forms, while the material life of society is viewed as mere factual content. In relating economy to rationality, Marxism overcomes the immediacy of form, historicizing it in contact with its content. This historicization can be extended to all the more abstract theories that arise on the basis of the formal structure of the economy. Philosophy is swept into the movement of history, and history itself becomes the study of the forms of reason. No longer a mere collection of contingent facts. The next chapter applies this approach to the history of classical German philosophy. The passage from Kant to Hegel is the key transition in this history. Lucas argues that the Kantian analytic understanding represents in philosophy, at the highest level of generality, the same reified formalism found in bourgeois political economy. Just as Hegelian reason transcends the understanding through a synthetic process of mediation, so Marxism transcends political economy.
For Lucas, however, Marx is not simply applying Hegelian dialectics to a particular domain, nor are the formalistic categories of political economy merely categories of a specific social science. Bourgeois economics and the forms of existence in which it is the expression are the archetypal domain from which formalistic rationality arises as a cultural pattern. The general predominance of formalistic rationality in philosophy, science, law, and the other areas of the superstructures can now be explained on this basis. In linking political economy as form of appearance to its basis in the totality, Marx indicates the lines along which the concept of rationality would have to be revised to lose its formalistic limitation. Lucas thus rediscovers the Kant-Hegel problematic of rationality from these indications in the economic works. He identifies formal rationality with capitalism and dialectics with socialism as successive stages in the history of reason, and not as atemporal paradigms, each potentially valid throughout all of history. He regards this history of reason as the specific contribution of Marxism to the resolution of the problems raised by Hegel's philosophy. The great advance over Hegel made by the scientific standpoint of the proletariat as embodied in Marxism lay in its formulation of the categories of reflection, not as an eternal stage in the comprehension of reality in general, but rather as the necessary forms of existence and of thought of bourgeois society. Marxism thus grasped these categories as reifications of being and thought, and therewith discovered the dialectic in history itself. It is to Lucas's Metacritique of Philosophy that I will now turn.